Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. It is a pleasure for me to moderate this next installment of our keynote series as part of the Hamlin Symposium program, which ends at the end of July. And today I'm absolutely delighted to introduce a close friend, long-standing collaborate, collaborator, and an aficionado of chaos or computer-aided orthopedic surgery, and his name is Leo Joskowitz. Now, Leo is professor of, um, at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a post which he has held since uh, 1995. At Huji, he's the founder and director of CASMIP, as well as being a fellow of the IEEE, ASME, and MIKAI, and a long-standing member, as I said, of the executive of Chaos International, whom both him and I have given many years of our lives to. Leo is currently the president of MIKAI Society and was the secretary general of Chaos International, and ISCAS until he decided to pass on the button and take some rest from what are rather taxing uh, executive roles. Leo is also the recipient of the 2010 Mueller Award for Excellence in Computer Aided Surgery and the, in the 2007 K Innovation Award. He has published over 250 papers, book chapters and editorials and is uh, the inventor behind 12 issued patents. Um, he's on the editorial board of six journals, including Medical Image Analysis, the journal, the International Journal of Computer Aided Surgery, Computer Aided Surgery, and Nature Scientific Reports, has served on numerous program, numerous program committees, and has spent a career developing image-guided surgery technology across a variety of clinical special, specialties. Today, I am delighted to introduce his keynote, uh, entitled Accelerating Deep Learning Segmentation and Modeling for Medical Images, which I'm sure you will find uh, most amusing. Uh, Leo, over to you. Thank you for being with us. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ferdinando. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure and honor to be at the Virtual Hamlin Symposium, which uh, we all hope uh, will be held uh, in person uh, very soon. Indeed. Uh, <clears throat> today, um, I chose to speak about uh, deep learning and uh, I'm sure, do you see my screen okay now? Now, yes. Perfect. Okay, excellent. So <clears throat> what I chose to spoke about today is a topic that is related to uh, medical robotics and it really has to do with the create the segmentation and creation of models to assist surgeons and clinicians in uh, surgery. So <clears throat> I'm sure many or all of you have uh, been aware of the uh, trend of uh, using deep learning uh, for medical image processing. And uh, this is what I want to talk to uh, about today. So <clears throat> what is segmentation and modeling? In a word, the idea is to create some models, most of the time quantitative, from medical images for clinical decision making and treatment planning. For example, uh, here we have a diagnosis of a condition called sacroiliitis, in which you have to uh, <clears throat> detect the morphology of the joint, of the sacroiliac joint, in order to determine whether the condition happens or not. In this second image, you see uh, a model that shows the tumor, tumor levers uh, the tumors in the liver and the blood vessels. And the idea is to show the surgeon the location and to see where they are resectable or not. And of course, we also have uh, planning for uh, brain tumor radiosurgery in which uh, you need to locate uh, and delineate very precisely the brain tumors in order to do the uh, radiation uh, <clears throat> treatment. So we have uh, known already for the from the very beginning of this uh, uh, medical robotics that uh, images are a great source uh, for creating models, patient specific models and also generic models. So uh, we did all this uh, in a model based uh, uh, fashion for many years uh, until about five years ago in which the deep learning technology started to show up and did uh, some quite amazing things. And this is what I want to talk about. So if I look uh, very broadly on the computational model, which is really what we're talking about, we have more patients, less physicians, 
with respect to the ratio of patients. The treatment complexity and diversity is certainly getting more complex as <laughs> together with the, with the cost. And the images are becoming more complex. On the other hand, uh, big data is now ubiquitous and we have a lot, a lot of computer power, computer and networking power. So passing data around is not a problem anymore. And of course, we have these new AI technologies, uh, which uh, <coughs> we want to see how they can help uh, address the clinician problems. And it's really about the automation and the optimization of the clinical workflow, whether it be a radiologist or a surgeon or a physician, it's really about that. So if I may summarize in a single slide, what is the, what we're looking for in a, a model to create a computer model for something to address a clinical problem? I would choose two parameters <clears throat> uh, when I talk about automation and workflow optimization. One would be the physician time. So how much time would a physician need to invest in order to uh, make a decision or create a model? And what is the required accuracy? And of course, 100% accuracy is not always the target. It's not even clear what is 100% accuracy, but there is a certain clinical requirement above which a physician will feel confident uh, about the decision, okay? And in the current practice, we observe that in many cases, due to the lack of time, first of all, what is the clinical requirement? The, this accuracy, uh, is uh, this dotted line is usually not known. It's estimated. It's usually not patient specific. And most of this is performed manually. And if the physician was given more time, most likely you could get a better accuracy for the decision making. And the goal of the workflow optimization is basically to move this curve to the left, not necessarily full automation. Uh, this is not always a target, but you definitely want with the new practice to be, to be able to specify what is the clinical requirement or at least estimate it and be above that requirement. If you've done this, you've done something useful. So obviously less time and higher accuracy, but another important thing is the variability. So if you can define not, not what is the target, but what is the bounds of the target. For example, if you're doing a knee surgery, you want to know that for this patient, plus minus three degrees in virus valgus would be sufficient. Uh, and this would be the target. Even establishing this type of target is, is a, a challenging thing. But if you could do that, then you can quantify and reduce this observer variability, which is, uh, comes from the uncertainty, the nature of the uncertainty of the procedure and the decision, but also of course of the clinician. And we can observe in current practice that this observer variability uh, is quite wide. So for the given the same amount of time for two physicians, uh, what is achieved in terms of uh, clinical requirement accuracy varies quite a lot. And the idea is that with a computerized support, you could reduce also not only the time and improve the accuracy, but also quantify and reduce this observer variability. If you've achieved these three things, you base you are bound to get a better treatment. So this is the premise, a very, very general premise, both for radiology and for surgery. And nowadays, the way to create the model is to do deep learning. And this is the method of choice, but this is not a panacea. And this is what I want to talk about today. So there's a lot of buzz. The radiologists are the ones that got most excited about this. Uh, <clears throat> you can see this going already for several years. Companies, the Radiological Society of North America even has a, its own journal on artificial intelligence. Remember, these are clinicians, not technical people like us. Uh, and, and also in Mikai, you would see that most of the papers really deal with deep learning uh, uh, in its different aspects. Uh, and of course, this thing creates buzz and people say the doom of radiology, the doom of surgery, the doom of physicians. Uh, we know that uh, this usually is more hype than truth, but what is clearly uh, the case is that 
it will not replace radiologists or physicians anytime soon, but it will replace physicians that don't use this technology. Okay, and this is because of, if only to say that this uh, uh, decrease of time and increase in decrease in variability, that would already be a good enough reason to uh, use these tools. So from a very technical point of view, I assume that most of my audience is technical, but even for clinicians, you know very well that there is a gap between what you can do technically and what is relevant clinically. So for example, let's take a, a tumor in the lungs. Uh, if you want to first detect it, identify what type of tumor is, uh, classify if it's benign or malign, what type of it, and segment it to, for example, plan the treatment or the surgery. So the clinic, the technical task in this case is the segmentation, okay? <clears throat> in terms of a clinical value, for example, uh, you can do triage and ranking. If it's an incidental finding, it's there is or no tumor there. But for example, if you're doing follow-up and you've done a radiation therapy, you want to know what is the tumor volume difference and there, if there is a progression. Also, you translate this very technical uh, task to something which is clinically meaningful. And this is what we try to do all the time, okay? So there's no doubt that the voxel classification is a fundamental task and it's technically challenging. You create models, you create things. And so this technical task sits at the core of many of the clinical tasks that are of interest. And this is why classification is so important. So if we think about what is a model after all, it's a set of features or parameters and the relationships between them. So you know that when we did manual modeling, we basically extracted both the, the features and the relations manually. And this was an art. You had to learn how to speak to the clinicians and extract these features, understand what they, why they do what they do, and then create the relations and then write the program. Uh, machine learning techniques allow you uh, to use more features. Uh, here, you usually had about 10 features and several relations. Here, you can have 50 or even 100 features that you define manually. But then you can use the statistical methods to derive the relations and see which ones are the better classifiers to support these tasks. So the work focused shifted from doing custom coding to doing feature detection, understanding what are the important things, and then trying libraries of uh, about 10 different classifiers with different techniques and seeing which one leads the best results. So, the engineering comes at choosing and choosing the parameters for this. The promise of deep learning, of course, is that you can do both things automatically. You don't have to bother, okay? So this, of course, sounds too good to be true, but we know that there is a very famous axiom that's called the no free lunch axioms. And uh, uh, this is not a panacea because each approach requires different effort and data the type of effort and size of data is different and the effort by engineers and clinicians is different, okay? So what I want to claim is that obviously here, technical people like us had much more work. Uh, we needed a few examples, 10, 20 examples, a few interviews. This required about a hundred, but deep learning requires a lot of annotations, many annotations, and this shifts the work to the clinicians. It also shifts the type of work we do. We don't really try to understand anymore what's going on. We just ask for data and data and data. So some physicians uh, uh, correctly fear that they're gonna become annotators. But remember, clinicians are not annotators. They don't like to do that because you need some expertise to do this annotation, okay? You can train a researcher, a graduate student, eventually to do pretty good annotations, but you'd still need some supervision and expertise. So the time budget is short because as opposed to uh, natural images or images in other fields, the time budget is tight. This is not what physicians like to do. The annotation quality is a key issue. You can more or less annotate where is the liver, 
but if you really want to do radiation therapy, you better know where the white matter is and whether the different blood vessels are. So you cannot just rely on an automatic annotation. The case is distribution. Deep learning is really about learning distributions. And you have to basically sample a distribution which is completely unknown. You have no idea of what it is. And of course, you have the issue of the observer variability which comes back again and again. So basically what you would see is that uh, the name of the game is uh, to try to guess this distribution. But you can see that in many clinical tasks, this distribution has a long tail. It's called a long dinosaur tail. Uh, if we look at the frequency of the cases, how frequent are certain cases by the case type, you know that if you collect data, let's say 100, 200, 500 data sets, there are going to be common cases. And the vast majority of cases are going to come there. You're going to get quite good performance. But what about the rare cases? You don't even know where they are. You might be able to get them. You have to wait a long time to get them. And these, it's very unlikely that you're going to get those in the training set. And if their distance to the common ones are, is large, you cannot ignore them. The rare cases are the norm. You cannot just say, oh, OK, we'll handle this differently. You have to detect those. You have to find methods to say, to know that your, your uh, the classifier is not reliable. And this is key. Uh, so this creates a big challenge. The other issue is the observer variability. I'm showing you here the, this uh, long tumor. The long is upside down. We asked 10 radiologists to delineate this tumor. OK, the problem here comes the ground truth. When you do uh, surgery or you want to compare your measurements to something, you have to establish a ground truth. What is the ground truth? It's patient specific. Let's say that you want to um, excise this tumor and you need to know uh, what is the volume and, and to know what kind of treatment you want to give. So we asked 10 radiologists from our department to delineate this tumor manually, OK? <clears throat> and this is the result we got. What you see here, each one of the colors is a different radiologist, OK? Each one of them delineated the tumor. And then the senior, the head of the radiology department, decided whether it was a plausible delineation or not. So you see that in some areas, there's very little variability. The boundary is clear. But there are other areas in which the variation is huge. Look at this. There are even areas in which they don't agree whether this is a tumor or not. And this is not because these people are not conscientious or not knowledgeable. But this is variability. And this is variability at it, at its, its best. So you have to be aware of this because your model is only going to be as good as the observer variability. And we have documented this in a paper uh, which basically says that the range is huge between 5 and 50 percent. That's the observer variability. So obviously, uh, you cannot take every time 10 ones. But the good news is that it can be quantified and estimated. So if you don't have 10 radiologists or 10 clinicians, you still can give an estimate. And this is not the top of this top, to topic of this topic. But this is something you should be aware of. So, OK, so let's say now <clears throat> comes uh, your orthopedic surgeon and says, OK, I need to, to uh, segment uh, vertebrae in MRI because I'm going to have to uh, perform surgery. And I need to know precisely uh, what it, where is the disc, what is the position, and so on and so forth. So you have to do a segmentation. It has to be an accurate one. And you want, because you're a high-tech uh, researcher, you want to do it with deep learning. What does it take? So first of all, you need to collect this data before the annotation, OK? About one to 5,000 ones for segmentation. If you're doing classification, normal, abnormal, malign, benign, you need even more, a large number. And then you have to annotate those, OK? How long does it take? It's going to take you a, a couple of thousand of, of clinician hours. I wrote here radiologists, but it's going to be the physician. And but remember, physicians don't like to do that because they're not trained to do that. You can train a graduate student to do that. But then you need 
robustness and coverage because this long dinosaur tail is going to force you to look at new cases and the system is going to produce poor results for those. So this is going to be a very significant effort, which is not on the hands of technical people like us. So this is a problem. You're going to custom develop solutions for hundreds of specific organs, structures, pathologies, and basically you're creating narrow AI, one RAD app for each. Okay, so this is a lengthy and costly development. If you think about uh, narrow AI, it takes a long time and has high cost. Let's say here you have different disciplines, you have different uh, 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 imaging modalities, uh, and then what you're really doing is developing one small uh, 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 box in this huge matrix. It doesn't have to be two dimensional because for breast imaging and ultrasound, you have tumors, you have other things. So think of this huge matrix that we're filling in a very laborious way, point by point. So this is a lot of work and it's very expensive. So what's going to happen and is happening now, for example, we took the example of the spine, you're going to do it here. But how is it going to work when I did this for CT and now I need to do it for MRI? Can I do transfer learning? Can I, what am I going to have to do? Well, it's not clear now. You're going to still have to collect quite a number of annotated data sets. So what you're seeing is uh, uh, companies and researchers are picking the low hanging fruits. If you look at this, you say, what is the most urgent and the most profitable? and the most important scientifically and uh, uh, technically, uh, 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 clinically conditions, you develop your narrow AI solution and then you move on. But for most of those boxes, it's not cost effective. So you're gonna be stuck by not able, the physicians, the clinicians, the surgeons are gonna come, oh, I want a system for doing this and a system for doing this and a system for doing this. My answer is, okay, annotate, give me a hundred annotated data sets and, uh, and then I'll be able to work with you. So this is not a satisfactory solution. So what's the bottom line? You have to create the data sets yourself. Don't rely on public data sets or different things. They might come in the future, but in most cases, it's never the way, the type of data you need and the way you need it annotated. So bootstrapping means you're going to have to develop and create these annotations on the go. Okay. And this is what I want to talk about today very briefly. Uh, I equate deep learning to having a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce that requires a huge uh, uh, tank of uh, fuel behind it. Or if you're ecologically minded, think of this as an electric car with a huge power supply that is uh, 10 times larger than the, than the car. So you need physician validated annotations. Otherwise the car is never gonna get anywhere. Okay, your Rolls Royce is never gonna get to the corner if you don't have annotations. So here's my pyramid, you have quantity and you have quality, right? What is the top of the quality, the top of the pyramid? An annotated uh, uh, CT or MRI by two independent experts, uh, which agree, okay? So this, you don't take 10, but you take two of them. And if they agree, and those are in experts, this is high quality annotation. At the bottom of the pyramid, you have the annotations that have been automatically generated and have not been looked by a clinician. So some of them might be good, some of them are bad, but you really have no idea of their quality. You can get many of those, okay? But there's a lot in between. The next level would be manual annotation by one expert or uh, generated by a network and corrected by two independent experts or one independent experts. And then we can use a residence, graduate students, or trained people from the street to do this. And then you create a series of qualities for these annotations, okay? And you're gonna have to work with a mixed bag of annotations of different qualities. And the goal here is that you're gonna get a lot of low or mixed quality annotations 
you're going to train a network to perform some minimal work, and then you need to do some quality control. Okay, so let's say I trained one with 50 data sets and now I get 100, but I don't know what the quality is. I need an expert to look at them. So you're going to do that and then you're going to move some of these to the upper levels of the pyramid. You're going to get high quality annotations and with these high quality annotations, you can retrain the network and get better results. Okay, so in terms of optimization, you have the cost of a radiologist for each task. Okay, in the pyramid, the cost goes up. Graduate students are cheap, residents are, le are less expensive and so on. The most expensive is the expert in terms of time, if you wish. And then the goal is to move as many annotations to the top of the pyramid. <coughs> so basically, sorry, The goal is to create a workflow that minimizes the cost of the annotation. Remember, a deep, a deep network with no annotated data doesn't do anything. It's like a Rolls Royce with no uh, fuel. So I chose a brief example to illustrate this. It's not about surgery, but <clears throat> it's related. It's a fetal MRI. And I chose this because in this case, the segmentation is very uh, challenging. Uh, and this is the idea. The clinical motivation is as follows. Uh, in about 1% of the cases of pregnancies, women get uh, an MRI because MRI has much more information than ultrasound and especially for the brain. You want to perform a segmentation of the body and the brain and the placenta, perform a series of measurements Okay, and automatically create a report, a quantitative report that gives different measures of clinical value. And then basically, for example, you can say if let's say take one parameter, the fetus volume, you have what's called a fetal development curves, the gestation age in weeks from 18 to 40 weeks and the fetal body volume you know that for this specific fetus, if the volume is in the lower a certain percentile, it, it means trouble, okay? It means that there is a certain condition. And this is true for a variety of measurements, including the ones in the brain, okay? So <clears throat> ideally, nowadays, there is, uh, the clinician has to look at this MRI and, and manually deduce measurements, okay? The, this is more difficult because the scanning sequences are not standard. So to develop these fetal curves, you need a lot of, uh, of, of normal and abnormal cases and a lot of segmentations to define that volume. So how do you go about this? And I'll describe to you how we were able to create many validated sets relatively quickly. So you obtain five to 10 manual segmentations for each structure, the brain, and the body at different gestational ages. You train a deep network that barely works. So you manage to get it to converge. You make the corrections on the new scan with another network. So I'll show you a network that is able to take corrections from a physician and then uh, create better ones. And then you end up with about 50 to 100 high quality validated cases. You retrain your network with these high quality annotations. And then you start performing error estimation and uncertainty. You prioritize, you feed now a hundred cases and then do automatic segmentation correction when you can, you do prioritization. And now you create more validated data sets. So at the end of this intermediate phase, you're gonna have hundreds of validated data sets. And now you're in good shape. Okay, so this is how you start. This is one way of starting. <clears throat> you have a network, it, it's trained on eight scans. <clears throat> In this case, each manual segmentation takes over one hour. Okay, especially for the brain, you need an expert to do that properly. You do the scan, you train the network on eight scans. So uh, this is a 2D, each one, each one has uh, about 50 slices. So you have about 500 slices that are annotated. You train the network. And now 
this is the type of segmentation that will be created. You don't need to be an expert to see that it's far from good. It's roughly there, this is the brain. You see here clear problems. <clears throat> the physician then uh, uh, corrects this manually, okay? And this, the, we have a new network that basically overfits uh, this correction and proposes a, a, a new segmentations for the five following slices. This is assuming certain spatial coherence. So in real time, the network uh, in about a second computes a, a user validated segmentation and produces the next slides. And you see here that it still has some errors, but it's gonna take less time to correct. Okay, so you're basically saving time for the corrections. So here's what happens. Uh, if you have two radiologists, this is the volume difference. At the beginning, you have no segmentation. In about 68 minutes, you create a volumetric segmentation that has an observer variability of about 10%, okay? Now, if you use the network that was trained with only eight data sets, you still start not from zero, but it's about uh, the volume dif overlap difference or dice coefficient is about uh, uh, zero, 35% uh, of overlap. But if you correct that, you still don't do much because the correction, although you started lower, the corrections they still takes a long time. So you didn't do much. However, with the method I showed you, you can still, because you're learning how to correct, not the segmentation, you can reduce this time. And in this case, it's very dramatic because the structure is large, okay? So, and also you reach the same observer variability. I show you here for two observers. So you're still within the same observer variability, but you did it in much less time, okay? So this is how we created the cases. We trained the networks and then we extend the coverage. We now train a hundred cases. But the problem now is that there are too many to validate. You're not gonna ask the expert radiologist to look at a hundred cases. You need to prioritize. What do you do? Segmentation uncertainty estimation. And, and this is a, a simple method. This is an example of segmentation error. You do a test time augmentation and you take the union and intersection of those. And this is the uncertainty zone. Here you can see a large zone. Here you see a small variability, which means the network is quite sure that this segmentation is correct, but there's a huge uncertainty here. So it's worth that to have a clinician look at this slice and tell us whether this is correct or not. So this is what, <clears throat> what we do, a network that basically learns on how to do this. In some cases, you can correct it. In other cases, you just prioritize, okay? So this is the case in which you can combine that, and I'm just skipping that, but <clears throat> this is some results of, if you apply this methodology, we started with the fetal body, we started with 13 scan, trained on nine and tested on five. And then the intermediate phase, we did on 64 scans, but this time not from scratch. And the same from the fetal brain and the placenta. And in all cases, we are able now to obtain a high quality network, okay? If you prioritize by uncertainty, you can reduce the time to achieve observer variability by a third. So after 12% of the slices corrected, given prioritization by uncertainty, you can reach the observer variability. You don't need to look at about a third of those. So this also directs you on what to, where is the network uncertain, okay? So inspection and correction of 12% of the slices achieve the observer variability instead of 33%. And remember, we're talking about hundreds of scans now, okay? So to end this story, uh, we are already now at uh, the advanced stage. Now it's not 300, we have now 800 data sets with a modest effort. Remember, we're not Philips or GE. We didn't invest millions of dollars in doing that with the same team. All the students learned how to correct by now. So now it's also more efficient. And you see here, also we managed to do a protocol transfer with different uh, scanning protocols and achieve a very high level of accuracy. And with this, we were able to generate 
the development curves, okay? So this is just a story that I wanted to share with you of an example of how to do, go about this. We did this with different things, including different applications in orthopedics, which I'm not going to uh, describe now. So we also managed to do some transfer learning and self-training for tro protocol transfer. We did this from two MRI protocols, still not clear if this works from CT to MRI, but at least this is the direction. Okay. So what is the take home message? Uh, no doubt that deep learning classification works. It's a very valuable technology provided you give it enough high quality annotated data. And this is the bottleneck because it's hard and expensive to obtain. And, and what I'm arguing is that at least for research purposes, you have to create them by yourself by having a tight loop with a clinician and a bootstrapping approach. You have simultaneous validation and correction, and you have to optimize the physician time. So annotations are on the go. Uh, you provide a useful measure. Why did we convince the physicians to correct the fetal annotations? Because they give a volume and they know that after five minutes, they get a valuable measurement, which they're confident because they, they, they looked at the slices and at the annotations. So they're willing to do that because the value, the measure they get is valuable, okay? And the... Uh, prioritization is also very valuable. So this also accommodates rare and unseen cases because the clinician is gonna to have to spend more time and that's okay, but you didn't rule out the case. You didn't say, oh, sorry, I can't do this. And this is important. And also it gives you a way to uh, estimate the observer variability. Okay. So what do I see for the future? Uh, no doubt that this is very effective. Uh, and you cannot turn physicians into annotators, but what you, we're gonna do is basically to create workflows and technology to be able to quickly fill these cases in a much more uh, time and cost-effective way, okay? And this is the really the model that you're looking for. And this could be with a new network or, or a different technique, but remember, in the end, a car with no fuel doesn't drive no matter how good is the car. So this is how to involve in this new era, the clinicians and the physicians to do that, okay? Uh, so I'd be happy to take your questions. I just have to, of course, thank uh, a bunch of people from the Tel Aviv Suraski Medical Center, uh, from the Adassa Medical Center and uh, uh, different students and the companies that we work with. Uh, the good news, as this is two weeks ago, no masks, but of course, enjoy it while it lasts because one never knows what happens in the future. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Leo. A reminder to the audience to please share their questions to Leo on the Q&A tab so that I can put those questions to Leo and see what he has to say about them. Uh, I certainly have a, a, a quite a few questions of my own. Uh, Incidentally, though, before we even start, since you mentioned that, how are things in Israel at the moment with COVID? Because uh, basically, you are basically taught taught us the way, right? So I mean, your 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 digital online repository of data is basically the the the, the, the gold standard against which every other country is, is comparing. And I think both me and my wife have been spending days looking at the data, reassured that you know, the vaccines are working and so on. But on the on the shop floor, how are things there? Is it sort of back to normal or not yet? We had a period, yes. We had a period between April and uh, a month, about a month ago, in which basically there were no restrictions anymore, no masks. 70% of the population was vaccinated. Uh, the vaccine was extended to 12 years olds as well. Uh, and then came the variants. And the variants came mostly uh, via foreign travel. Yeah, of course. So the restrictions started coming back, but it's looking at least at the moment that uh, it's milder. So, uh, so you're we're still sort of in a transition. Open, though, right? 
<laughs> so we still now open. have masks yeah. in the public transport and so on, right. but uh, we still feel quite good for the moment, for the moment. So Fingers enjoy crossed. it while it lasts. We're all, we're all we're like the, the test ground for the whole world. So let's see what happens. Wonderful. So back to topic, and please do um, ask your own questions on there. We've got a, a thank you from Brian Saab from Michigan, USA, uh, from Michigan, USA, who's a radiologist. So thank you very much. Um, we've got an, um, a question here from Raghavendra Viri, and he or she says, how to handle scan variability as also with different vendors, the image data quality changes. So the algorithm should adapt to this variability. So how to handle this? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Asla. Uh, uh, this is an excellent question. This is part of the robustness. If you think of the different phases of the development, you're going to get your first network working with annotations from your close collaborators yeah. with a certain uh, assumptions about the, 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 the scanning and the protocol and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you want to enlarge it to a, a larger data set. Uh, uh, and the idea is that you will still need to get more annotations. There's no way around that. Uh, you will, no matter how smart you get with the technical things, data normalization, you're still gonna have to ask the center for a period in which they will supply you, you will give them examples and they will supply you with annotations or they will correct the annotations. Yeah. You have to set the expectations. The, the question now is what is the minimal number of those that you need to have your network perform properly. And this is of course an open question, but with the methodology that I showed you, as long as you provide some valuable uh, 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 classification or segmentation and explain to the radiologists that at the beginning of the system, they have to work with you to create the annotations, uh, then this would be the way to go. Uh, especially if the protocols are similar, you might discover that it's so different that you need to train a different network. Uh, yeah. That could happen, especially for MRI scanning. But this is again an issue that you'll have to face. And the way to face it is to understand that you have to acquire also high quality annotations for those variable uh, different, yeah. different uh, parameters. In fact, from, from, from where I sit, Leo, if there is something that is quite special about the approach that you presented, it's, it's is very tuned into the best that you can you can tease out of your clinical colleagues so you get the machine doing what the machine is best at and you get the clinician to do what they are best at with the best blend between the two and that i have to say is something that i haven't seen very often in this sort of absolutely booming computer science field because you know you tend to have computer scientists that just delve into the numbers and with deep networks it's actually quite difficult to understand exactly what it is that the network has learned, right? And I think if there was- Well, any... I'll share you a secret. Nobody really understands what the network has really yeah, learned. Yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so so I, I, I really enjoyed your iterative human in the loop, expert, expert in the loop approach, because I, I really do see that even from a, from a lay perspective, from an outsider's perspective, you are making sure that you're getting the most out of your, your let's say the human contributor. Is there any way that we can teach that approach more broadly to our colleagues in computer science and so on, so that we can learn best practice in this very fast paced world of, of machine learning? So do, how, uh, how do you train your own software engineers to, 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 to do that, to value well, that? Just like uh, 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 we did when uh, we develop systems for surgery, you know that the most important thing is to take the student to the, uh, <clears throat> to the operating room and have them see exactly what the surgeon is doing and understand yeah. the context of what's yeah. happening. Diving deep in, uh, in uh, deep learning tools is great. I mean, again, if I come back to my analogy of the Rolls Royce and the fuel, you're going to develop uh, three carburetors, five wheels, and so on. And in the end, you're going to say, oh, but I have no fuel. So what am I going to do? So this is the thing. All our students, in the end, somehow become annotators. They have to understand 
what the data is, what is this, where is an error. So they have this dialogue with the expert and they set together and the expert sits and corrects them. At the beginning, there is a need for some patients to do that. And at a certain point, we only provide very few that the expert has to do. So it's to set up the right frame of mind. And, uh, and, and, and this is this is the and set the expectations right for the clinicians. I mean, the biggest mistake is to promise the radiologists that the screening is fully automatic and everything is going to be taken care of. I mean, this is going to cause a ruin in the end. Yeah, I completely agree. And is is part of this work? Is it going to see commercial um, outputs, or do you think the, uh, we are still at the stage where? the most impactful thing that we could do with all of this progress is to make it available to the wider research community so that we can get to a stage where this can be, these tools can be properly clinically impactful in the broader sense. Okay, so the way I think is the following. The low, what I call the low hanging fruit, which is I would estimate at about 20 to 30 applications where it's very clear that investing whatever, one to five million euros to develop and get this done will be done because there is a high economic value, okay? But then of course, this is gonna leave many things in the open. So companies and, and, and researchers are starting to understand that the data, the, the annotation generation is one of the keys and they're providing tools. And so this is evolving. In parallel, the, the clinical societies are aware of this. Uh, the, radio, the RSNA and the European uh, radio, uh, Society for Radiology is very well aware of this and is starting to create repositories with data and with annotations. But this is going to be slow and you will never find exactly what you need because you want to address a specific problem. So this is why I advocate that for 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 all those other things and for researchers at the university, you have to create your own data and your own annotations in the most cost efficient way. And from that will come companies that will help you do that because in the end, this production of annotations, high quality validated annotations is going to be of economic importance and there's going to be uh, uh, of interest, of commercial interest. And this, there are already companies that are starting to do that. And so, so, so uh, you take the example of um, the work that Mika Society is doing. And so we are being rather successful in sort of promoting best practice and creating this sort of open access repository where people can train and develop and advance the state of the art. Do, 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 through, through the many years of experience, have you any guess as to how you'd also incentivize industry to be a bit more forthcoming with some of their data. They will be unique in trying to understand how best to, to, to advance uh, the technology. Because I, I, I absolutely unequivocally see both sides. You know, it's a business. It has to make a profit. It has to pr protect its intellectual right. property. So is there a win-win? I think this is the type of efforts that can be undertaken by the European Union or something which creates a consortium in which there is an interest of, uh, of, of creating such data sets. But remember, because you not only need the data, but also the annotations, it's never gonna be the exact type of annotations you need for that. Yeah. So they're undergoing efforts uh, to do that. And, the, and, and this is probably best at the level of uh, governments or continents to do that, that are undergoing. Industry by nature would not necessarily do that uh, so, by so, on its own. So if I paraphrase, if you'd say, is it gonna be more stick? or carrot, I guess it's more stick, right? So it will be the government that has to force. Well, I mean, you don't force. I mean, there's an economic need again. I mean, this is gonna happen naturally because the cost today is in the data and annotation gathering, not in the, in the salary of the, 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 the deep learning people that are developing that. So the cost is shifted towards uh, at least for the moment to the generation of this data. So this is gonna happen naturally, whether they want to share it for the, uh, to, to find a common platform that everybody benefits like 3, 5, 4G or 5G or something like that, it's hard to know. 
I would be somewhat skeptical because the history of uh, of this type of sharing in the in 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 the in the, the medical imaging community has not been very good. Yeah. But uh, but again, things are changing, so this could happen. I hope I'm wrong. So you see the the you know you you mentioned the what is good enough, right? And that's been the the, the never ending quandary in orthopedics, which we both work a lot in. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know without, you know, this trying to push the world to be a little bit more transparent, how we get to a point where not only you can demonstrate that you can do things better, you can reduce the amount of people time to do to 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 diagnose or 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 in fact even screen, yeah, this increasing the ever increasing amount of data. But ideally, you'd want to say, you know, this is good enough. This you know you know this will be it, and I don't know whether machine learning is a tool that could help us get there quicker. So how do you harvest that? Okay, thank you, thank you. This is also related to a question I see here yeah. about uh, did you evaluate the effect of clinician involvement in the increase of trust in the derivative and clinically pertinent metrics? So um, we didn't do this formally, like in a study that has to be done in which you do a controlled study with your tool, without the tool, and the confidence. But you see that the issue of validating, so I was talking about segmentation. We show, we let the, the expert radiologist uh, go through the slides, yeah. the slices and see the segmentation. And so she can quite quickly spot if there is a problem. But after seeing that, she trusts the volumetric measurement because she has seen it. So in exchange of a few minutes of that, there is a, 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 a measure which is of clinical value, which is the volume right. of the fet of fetal body. And so this is the trust. The, eyes, the trust is, is the eyes of the expert that now has confidence. I don't have to explain how the, the, the machine learning works, but if the result is validated or even partially validated, I point, look at five slices tell me if those critical five slices do you agree with the segmentation increases the that and then it's okay yeah. so this I is why i think nothing. that the, the the human aspect the validation has to be left to the human this is what i i strongly believe that i think you're onto something and i think it is the key right in fact i see brian's yeah it's a smart tools in the hands of the clinicians, and I think that 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 absolutely is, we uh, we uh, yeah. we yeah. always argue that regardless of whether it's deep learning, model based, robotics, in the end, uh, uh, we're providing okay. the tools. So not a holy grail, not a replacement, but rather, yeah, the next generation of empowerment. God willing, Leo. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for a fantastic thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the audience for joining in with questions and and please do remember and remind your colleagues that this talk as well as all the others will soon be available on our YouTube channel. And again, thanks Leo for thank a you. wonderful talk and I will see you thank all you very soon. Thank you for the invitation. Leo, bye -bye. see you soon, hopefully face to face next year. If yes, not before. Thank you. Ciao. Thank Say you for everyone. Me. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.